So Dying Light 2 recently has been delayed indefinitely. Techland has come out and said that they need a little bit more development time to make sure that this game reaches its fullest potential and hits the vision that they have for it, which is fantastic. You know, I'm glad that they're taking some additional time to make sure that this game is perfect. Unfortunately, on the other hand, it means that for the next couple months, we might be hitting a informational drought, so to speak. We're not going to be seeing too much or hearing that much about this game. And like I said, it might be a while before we hear anything concrete. But in the meantime, while we impatiently wait for some more information on Dying Light 2, I thought it'd be a good idea to utilize this downtime to strengthen our knowledge on the original game to help bridge the gap from the original to the sequel. With Dying Light 2 being seemingly much more narratively focused, I wanted to kick this off with the unspoken star of the two games. That being the Ron virus. We learned fairly early on in the original game from Dr. Zara that this virus is a derivative of rabies and there as of now is no cure. Supposed to get a vaccine? What? No, no. Suppressant. It's called antison. Suppresses the symptoms here, sit. Antizen postpones the inevitable. Best the GRE could do. Inevitable? So th there's no cure? It's a variation of rabies. There's no cure right now. But you see, I've been running tests on both antizen and infected tissue. Now with there being a 15 year gap between both games and the evolution of the virus being preached on promotional artwork and this being supported by gameplay we got at last year's E3, which they showed that it may potentially now be airborne, it's going to be interesting to see what Techland does with this narratively and how the evolution is going to impact the gameplay. Anyways, what we know of the virus from the original game is that it's a derivative of rabies and the transmission of it is primarily through bodily fluid, hence receiving a bite from an infected person would in turn lead to yourself becoming infected or a quote unquote zombie. Zombie. The spread of the infection, however, can be avoided if one is quick enough in chopping off the infected limb. We actually see a case of this in the side mission Cease and Desist, where Haran's governor was bitten and saved by Kareem by amputating his leg. However, Kareem was my bodyguard. He allowed me to get bitten, but I don't really blame him for that. He saved your life. By hacking off my leg? The morning I was bitten was the same day they began dropping suppressants. If, however, amputation isn't an option and one does become infected, they begin to suffer seizures that cause fatigue and blurred vision, which we see periodically through the campaign as Crane starts to turn when going long periods of time without antizen, the game suppressant of the virus. Along with the seizures and blurred vision, victims also exhibit a pale complexion, well-looking malnourished, which we see with Jade, and even hallucinations as we see Crane attacking Jade while on the brink of turning himself. Oh my god! No, not this again! Oh. Which also, fun fact, makes sense as it actually keeps to the symptoms of rabies. Unfortunately, side of Dying Light's never actually said or shown as to what the turning process is, but here's a few things we can discern based off of the gameplay alone. One can transform into a zombie as quick as a few hours after being bitten. The first stage of turning transforms one into a viral, an extremely fast, aggressive enemy type that's attracted by loud noises. At this early stage, viral stuff control their basic motor skills, they have the ability to dodge your attacks, climb up the side of buildings, and even to some degree speak as they will sometimes stop their attack and beg for mercy. After the first stage, which is the viral stage, there are nine potential mutations. Now the game never actually says what the determining factor is that says who transforms into what, but the general consensus is that the first stage is becoming a viral, while the last stage is believed to be deteriorating to becoming a biter. The biters being the most common enemy type inside a dying light and thought to be affected by the main strain of the Ron virus. So theoretically, potentially, we know the first and the last stage being a viral and then ultimately being a biter but obviously there's some deviation along the way. We have goons, demolishers, toads, and bombers. Unfortunately, as far as the first game is concerned, there's no suggestion or even concrete evidence to say what determines these mutations. It seems to go strictly off of a case-by-case -case basis. But beyond these, there are two zombie types that we can speculate on because we are given a little bit of information or some teases here and there to hypothesize. The first one being screamers.
Now we know screamers were children when they died or when they became infected, and with the Ron virus, it boosts up the infected fight or flight response. With the screamers specifically, it boosts up their flight response, they don't attack directly. Instead, they pretty much keep to themselves, staying in places that were presumably their rooms before they died or potentially hideouts before they turned. And whenever getting within a couple feet of them or startling them, they scream in a very high-pitched voice that attract all nearby infected. So although they don't attack you directly, they are pretty dangerous because in a very short amount of time, with just one scream, you can be taken out by a handful of virals. And the reason why I find screamers so interesting is because they sort of bypass the whole understanding of the first stage of turning. There are no viral children inside of Dying Light. That could potentially be because Teclan maybe just didn't want to see people drop kicking children off the side of buildings or sticking a little bit more to the lore. It could be because before they turned, since they haven't hit puberty yet and they don't have a certain amount of testosterone or aggressiveness in their body, the chemical imbalance coupled with the Haran virus favors more of a flight response versus an aggressive response. I mean, that's just my guess there. That makes a little bit more sense to keep it with the lore. It could also, again, be that Teclan just didn't want to see people kicking kids off the side of buildings, which makes sense in its own right but also the idea I pitched there still kind of sticks to the lore so I like that. Now the other zombie type where we're given a little bit of information on are volatiles and how someone can transform into becoming a volatile. It seems like before someone even fully transforms into a viral they have to become incubated inside of a volatile hive where they then begin the process of transforming from their human form to their very unique volatile physique. Now one of the side missions in the following titled Ascend Over Flesh we actually see this process in action. In this side mission Crane is sent to Sabbath's cottage to find some herbs where he then discovers that there's a volatile hive underneath this cottage. Upon investigating this Crane comes across Sabbath in the process of becoming a volatile. Now at this time Sabbath is still capable of speaking and it doesn't sound like this transformation is either painless or even quick. Now even though in the side mission we're given a pretty good amount of information on the process of becoming a volatile, we still aren't given an exact time frame on how long it takes for one to fully mutate or how fast one has to be incubated in order for them to successfully evolve. This obviously leaves a little bit of guessing room that will hopefully be enlightened on in the sequel, but seeing how it's said that one can become a viral within a few hours or even a couple days, I'd say it's not too far-fetched to say that it's based off of how fast the virus takes over its host and maybe even where the person is at a particular stage of the virus. You know. If they're in an area with little to no sunlight and at a particular time of the transformation that may increase their chances of mutating rather than progressing into the usual viral stage. That's what I'm guessing anyway. So that's pretty much the gist of the Ron virus. Moving forward 15 years, Dying Light 2 really seems to be making a stronger emphasis on UV weapons against the infected. In the original game, the only real infected where you could use UV weapons on effectively were volatiles. Flashing them stops them from pursuing or even aggressively attacking you for the moment, which was more of a deterrent weapon to help you catch your breath. Now in the sequel, based off of last year's E3 gameplay, it looks like Teclan is making greater use of these weapons by seemingly having them work on normal biters as well. In the gameplay that was shown last year, there's a moment where Aiden, that game's protagonist, falls into a lower level of a skyscraper as the floor underneath him gives out. This accidentally lands him into a dark zone where he now has to fight his way out through a pretty dense crowd of infected. Quick side note, in the original game, dark zones were just places you could find volatiles in during the day, and that was about it. There was almost no reason to venture into them, and it wasn't like there was rare loot or anything in these locations. But in this game, it looks like Teclan is really letting that idea blossom into its own thing. Possibly even replacing quarantine zones from the original game, dark zones look like hotbeds for infected activity, and potentially might even present a nice high risk versus high reward situation where we could find good weapons, disaster relief packages, or even medicine. But these dark zones could potentially be where the majority of the infected the game are during the day and emerge to roam the streets at night. But returning to the gameplay during the section, we see a few indications of how the virus has evolved. First, it's worth noting Aiden is wearing a biomarker which seems to be tied to the meter at the top of the screen and the longer Aiden stayed in the dark zone the marker started losing green dots on his wrist and the meter at the top was flashing critical immunity which could mean that the virus is now airborne or at least in dark zones that's the case where the infected have a significant presence combined with the lack of sunlight it allows the virus to thrive and become airborne when sunlight or UV lights are introduced into the environment it not only deters the infected temporarily but immediately kills the virus that's airborne around you this seems to be corroborated 
needed. When Aiden throws out his UV flare, the meter at the top of the screen starts to refill and his biomarker seemingly starts to restabilize. So even though potentially the virus is now airborne, I wouldn't expect it in buildings where sunlight is easily accessible. I would expect it more inside of sewers or like this gameplay has shown in the lower levels of skyscrapers where all the windows are boarded up and there's no sunlight present, which would allow the virus to thrive. Now in the same gameplay, we see the UV light stop what looks like normal biters. Albeit seemingly more aggressive than the usual biter, they visibly aren't any more mutated. I'd say that this is a sign of Teclan strengthening their night versus day cycle, which was a huge driving force with the original game, where at night biters became more aggressive and can even regress back to their viral stage, making them more agile and even recovering some of their lost motor skills. Here in this gameplay, it's interesting that even though they don't seem to be mutated to the same degree of volatiles, making their flesh visibly vulnerable to UV lights, they do react in a way that seems like even though they aren't visibly altered out of their biter stage, UV lights are still effective on them. There's a few instances throughout this gameplay where Aiden has stopped a charged attack, if only for a few seconds to escape by pulling out a UV flare or even flashing them with a UV flashlight. I'd say this means one of two things. Either again, this is just Teclan strengthening their night versus day cycle, giving us a taste of what's to come, with the infected's boosted aggression once the sun goes down, or it may even be them presenting this game's version of virals. The reason why I think that is because all the zombie types that are aggressively pursuing Aiden visibly all look the same in terms of the mutation. These aggressive infected also seem to have biomarkers suggesting that they may have turned recently. There's also a quick point in the video where one of these infected are standing facing the wall and are seen panting and breathing in a similar fashion of a viral. It's obviously just my assumption anyways. Uh, Rewatching the gameplay, it also looks like we're going to be getting a stronger difference between a UV flashlight and a UV flare. In the gameplay, we see the UV flashlight work pretty effectively on the virals that are aggressively pursuing Aiden. Again, you have to aim that. Meanwhile, with UV flare, it seems to work on everything. Not only stopping virals, but, but again, killing the virus that's airborne and also stopping the biters. Who knows, we may even see a stark difference between the biters that roam the streets during the day and the biters that come out from the dark zone to roam the streets at night. But of course, we're just gonna have to wait and see until Dying Light 2 finally comes out. But that's gonna go ahead and wrap it up for this video. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. If there's anything you want to add to it in terms of the origin, the speculation of the evolution of the Ron virus going from the original Dying Light to its sequel, and how Teclan might present the evolution, who knows, they might even give us a little bit of insight to the start of the original game. But feel free to share all that stuff down in the comment section below. Like always, guys, my name is Cynic. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you did enjoy. If you did, do me the favor of dropping me a like, or if you're brand new to the channel, subscribe. I put out videos that seem like they have substance, and then somewhere along the way, I lose my focus, or throughout the video, the main point loses its punch. But you know what? That, that's okay. We'll get them next time. This is Ayo speaking. Get to the nearest safe house and wait until dawn. Good night, and good luck. Ooh.